Hi there. If you want to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, if you want to put your name and company, that would be great. We're glad you're here joining us today. Hi, Susan. Alf. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, how are you? Good, how are you? All right, so while everyone is trickling in, we are going to go through some very quick housekeeping. And um, just real quick, good morning and happy Friday. We're really thankful for everyone joining us today. Um, so if you are able, um, please enable your video cameras by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. But of course, this is not required. Um, also located at the bottom left of your screen <clears throat> is the mute or unmute button. So please ensure that your mic is muted throughout the presentation unless you are called on to ask a question. Um, we also ask that all participants please insert any questions and commentary for our guest speakers and presenters in the chat. Um, our staff will take note of all questions and present them to the group in the order that they appear. Um, and of course, if any other technical issues come up or if y'all just need to contact someone real quick, feel free to send a direct chat to any of the Valley Vision folks and we'll address it very quickly. Thank you. Thanks, I'll turn Danielle. it back over to Renee. Thank you. And I am here today joined by uh, Kim, Kim Harrell, who's an uh, Associate Vice President of Economic and Workforce with the Community Colleges, uh, located at Consumers River College. Also, um, Jeff Briggs, who's the Regional Director of Employer Engagement um, for the manufacturing sector in the greater Sacramento region. Um, we're pleased to welcome you here today. I will open it up for either Kim or Jeff to give some opening comments. I'll go. Um, yeah, thank you everybody everybody for joining. We uh, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your uh, morning um, to, to be here and um, hopefully uh, gain some insights into uh, what's going on right now uh, in, in this, you know, in this region. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And it's great to see everybody here today. Thank you for coming. I don't know if you know, the genesis of this whole, uh, two part series was based upon some inquiries about, um, electrical vehicle training from uh, one of our high school consultants that was interested in pursuing, um, sort of a gathering to see what um, what types of jobs there might be in the area, what types of employer needs there are, and what types of sectors that this might cross. So I'm really excited to see the employer panel today. We have a great lineup, it looks like, and to meet all of you. And I just want to thank you for your time for being here today, because I know how busy you all are. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And um, these events are supported by the Los Rios Community College District in uh, collaboration with Yuba Community College, Lake Tahoe College, um, also supported by the Centers of Excellence at Los Rios, and they are supported by Strong Workforce Funds. Um, can you go to the next slide, Danielle? Thank you. Uh, so this is how the event is brought to you today. Um, this is the second in a two-part series, so I just um, want to call that out. If you missed the first part in this series, it is loaded on Valley Vision's website, and we will send that information out when we send out the recording for this event. At the first part in this series, we were able to hear from a consultant in the energy field, as well as a professor and program 
developer at Rio Hondo College who created a, kind of a front runner electric vehicle training program in their area. And we also heard from a panel of nonprofits that are and community-based organizations in K through 12 that are working in um, the pipeline, the early pipeline and neighborhood-based pipeline into these jobs. Um, so really putting that conversation together with today's conversation with employers and industry professionals, we are hoping it'll give us a, a well-rounded view and some ideas of where to go next uh, with what kind of training is needed in the greater Sacramento region. So as Kim said, thank you for giving us your time um, and participating in the conversation today. Um, after the uh, initial panel questions that we have, we'll be taking questions from the audience for the panel. So please um, think about some questions that you might have and feel free to bring those forward um, either in the chat or uh, by raising a hand after the initial panel questions are done. Um, so uh, next slide, please. The agenda we have for you today is we're completing the welcome and introduction. And then we have a keynote by Paul Lau from SMUD. It is pre-recorded as he had a conflict this morning, but I think you'll find it very engaging. Um, then we're gonna hear from Kim Harrell on some community college collaboration and changes related to employer engagement uh, at the community college level. And then we're gonna hear from our employer panel, which is uh, really um, the meat of this conversation. We're really excited to hear from today and, and then we'll wrap up. Next slide, please. So I will briefly introduce Paul to you. Um, Paul is the Chief Executive Officer and General Manager for SMUD. He started that position in October of 2020. He uh, is a 39-year veteran of the Sacramento Municipal Utility District and has held several other executive management positions before attaining the Chief Executive Officer spot. He serves on several boards throughout the region, and I'm not going to list them because there are so many. Uh, and I'm just going to have Danielle at this point um, start the keynote speech. And we're so thankful to SMUD for providing this to us. Please let me know if you cannot hear the video when I play it. Thank you, Renee. And thank you, Valley Vision, for organizing and facilitating today's event. I'm sorry I can't join you live, but I really appreciate the opportunity to share some opening remarks on behalf of SMUD about the importance of electric vehicle. SMUD is proud to support the efforts of Los Rios Community College District and other Valley Vision partners as you develop electric vehicle training programs across our region. I'd like to emphasize at the start of my remark that SMUD will continue to provide curriculum support and technical advice to our education and community college partners. We conduct EV test drive events and community workshops and have also donated EVs to our partners for hands-on training. We know that it's going to take a wide range of partnerships to facilitate the transition to electric vehicles. While SMUD has supported electric transportation solutions for more than 30 years, our commitment has intensified in recent months. Earlier this year, the SMUD board approved the most ambitious clean energy plan of any large U.S. utilities. SMUD's 2030 Zero Carbon Plan commits us to removing all carbon emissions from our power supply by the end of the decade. The electrification of transportation and building sectors are vital to the success of SMUD's Zero Carbon Plan since vehicles and buildings are two of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases in California. Mayor Steinberg, Governor Newsom, and President Biden are adamant in their believe that getting more electric vehicles on the road is integral to fighting climate change. SMUD's transportation electrification goals are even more aggressive than those outlined in the governor's executive order and the mayor's climate commission's goals for the state and Sacramento region. We have few refineries and smokestacks, but Sacramento does have very hot summers. We're situated in a valley. Some of the business interstates in California runs right through town. Our air quality is terrible, to put it bluntly. A report by the American Lungs Association ranks the Sacramento area the sixth worst in the country based on days of unhealthy air and unsafe level of air pollutions 
in the ozone layer. Now, as smudge power mix gets increasingly cleaner with renewable resources replacing carbon-based fuel, the increased electrification of vehicles will lead to better air quality and improve health outcomes, such as a reduction in childhood asthma rate, improving access and affordability. EV awareness in Sacramento Service Territory increased from 30% to 42% in less than two years. More and more customers at least kicking the tires, so to speak. And while we have a long road ahead of us, we're definitely moving in the right direction. To address the issue of range anxiety, SMUD has built six separate DC fast charging stations since 2014, including one at the Sacramento International Airport. This station enables EV owners to charge their vehicles to 80% capacity in less than 30 minutes. SMUD also offers incentives for residential, multifamily, workplace, and public charging. For instance, did you know that charging an EV at home on SMUD's off-peak rates is like paying less than a dollar for a gallon of gas? SMUD's reputation and track record helped lay the groundwork for Sacramento being designated the first green city by Electrify America, a Volkswagen subsidiary. We've committed $44 million in funding to the capital region, approximately 35% of which will be devoted to make electric transportation more accessible in low-income communities. Now, SMUD has three initiatives of our own to help improve access to electric transportation in underserved communities. Develop e-mobility hubs to engage community-based organizations and help them establish support for EVs. A sustainable communities vehicles and infrastructure incentive program to address equity and move EVs into areas that will benefit the most from improved air quality. Now workforce development efforts to create jobs in electric transportation industry. SMUD joined the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality District in supporting the Clean Class for All efforts. The program provides large discounts to own and drive electric vehicles to residents living in underserved neighborhoods. SMUD also teamed with the Air Quality Management District in the largest electric school bus deployment in the United States. SMUD led the regional effort to create and launch the California Mobility Center, or CMC, a public-private consortium focused on electric mobility innovation, with California at the center of the most innovative clean transportation and climate policies in the world. There's no better place for a major mobility center than in Sacramento. The CMC will foster clean e-mobility technologies and solutions that can scale and become engines of economic growth. SMUD is proud to be one of the founding members and leading financial supporters of the CMC. As is Los Rios, I'm happy to say. The CMC supports the development and commercialization of new clean mobility technologies, including electric vehicles, autonomous transportation, battery storage, shared mobility solutions, public transit, and more. The center currently operates out of a lease site at Army Depot Park. SMUD is working with Sac State on a, master's, on a master plan for the permanent CMC headquarters to be located along the Power Inn Corridor on Ramona Avenue. By focusing on the commercialization of new clean mobility solutions, we put more EVs on the road, advance a new industry that would drive good paying jobs and economic growth, and create workforce development and training opportunity that will reach deep into our underserved communities. A third party regional economic and job assessment analysis said the CMC and its service providers could generate an economic impact of $2.5 billion in the greater Sacramento area over the next five years. The CMC's operations could directly and indirect support approximately 8,500 jobs over the same time period, the analysis says. CMCs and workforce development. The cornerstone of the California Mobility Center has always been connecting new jobs in the mobility sector with training programs for people living in underserved communities. Largely through our sustainable community program, we've secured some great partners, 
including the Sacramento, the Greater Sacramento Urban League, La Familia Counseling Center, Asian Resources, Inc., the Sacramento Ac Academic and Vocational Academy, Los Rios, and the California Conservation Corps. Furthermore, the CMC's alliance with, Sac with Sac State, the UC Davis, and Los Rios Community College Districts provide mobility companies with an educated, readily accessible workforce. In late 2020, the City of Sacramento approved more than $1.4 million in CARES Act funding for the CMC. As I'm sure you know, the CARES Act is stimulus money that provides jobs and job training opportunities to underserved communities members who has been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Funding from the CARES Act enable 270 men and women to complete the workforce preparation training portion of the CMC. Now, SMUS Sustainable Community Program recently partnered with the Charles A. Jones Technical Training Program to launch the California Mobility Center Career Pathway Program. Nearly 300 participants has taken part in various aspects of the job readiness and technical training program. New funding from the California Workforce High Road Training Partnership Program will allow us to expand the program going forward. As daunting as the climate crisis may seem, SMUD is taking an innovative approach in the search for solutions. With the Zero Carbon Plan, we can showcase Sacramento as a model clean power region, attract climate-friendly businesses, and create good paying jobs, among other benefits. Equally important, we need to act quickly to protect all customers against climate change, particularly those customers who are impacted the most and, re and represented the least. The Environmental Protection Agency recently released an analysis that said racial minorities in the U.S. will bear a disproportionate burden of the negative health and environmental impact from a warming planet. The analysis found that Latinos are 43 percent more likely <clears throat> to live in communities that will lose work hours because of intense heat and black people will suffer significantly higher mortality rate from climate change. Now, the pro positive aspect of eliminating carbon from the smut power supply, such as better air quality, will be even more pronounced in our disadvantaged communities. And transportation electrification is pivotal to eliminating our reliance on carbon-based fuel. SMUT's sustainable community programs is built around the belief that we have a duty to assist customers in communities left behind by big institutions, including to some degree, SMUD. We're not just supporting cleaner energy and carbon reductions in these neighborhoods. We're teaming up with policymakers, healthcare providers, and community-based organizations to solve real problems for real people. We look forward to continuing to work with all of you to make this a better place to live. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know there's several from the SMUD team on this call. So thank you, especially to Susan Wheeler for helping arrange that uh, keynote address, even in lieu of Paul's scheduling uh, challenges. It was really exciting and interesting to learn about all that SMUD is doing and the work of the Mobility Center and how it all integrates to creating Sacramento as a leader in the state and in the nation for clean energy and jobs in this sector. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Kim Harrell to provide some information about employer engagement through the community college system. Thank you. Uh, I just tried to share my screen and it doesn't seem to be allowing me. One second, there you go. Let's see. This is host disabled participant screen sharing. Hold on here, I'm trying to figure that out. It's probably me. Okay, Danielle, if you can walk me through it, that might be helpful. Oh, wait, let's hear my co host. All right, there we go. Yeah, I think I did it. Okay. You should have it, Kim.
Great. All right. Great. Thank you. And everybody can see and hear. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I'm pleased today to share with you an update on um, the North Far North Regional Coordination and Collaboration RFA that we spent the last probably two to three months putting together. If you're not familiar, the North Far North is a consortium of 15 colleges all the way up to the Oregon border, um, all the way out east to Lake Tahoe and down south uh, by Kissimmee River College. We basically have two sub-regions, a far north region as well as a, as a north region, which is mainly the Sacramento area, Lake Tahoe, um, Woodland and Yuba community colleges. So uh, right now, uh, the North Far North is hosted out of Butte College. It has been for many, many years, and there hasn't been an RFA to um, allow other co community colleges to uh, apply to serve as a host college for the consortia. There's about seven consortia in the state. And so that's the process that we went through and all 15 colleges agreed to have you uh, to have Butte College continue to serve in the role as the host of the North Far North Consortium. The idea of the reissuing of the um, hosting of the consortium was also to address employer responsiveness, increasing work-based learning opportunities for our students and also increasing job placement. So it was very focused on changing the way that we do business in terms of working with our employers. Oops, let's see if I can go to the next one. It's not letting me advance my slides for some reason. Hmm. Oh, here we go, let me try this. There we go. So um, what we have done after um, weeks and weeks and even months of work, um, we set up some subcommittees and we um, have changed to sort of the face of the North Far North, as well as the organizational and governance structure. So everything in purple is new. So we have a new governance structure, which I'll explain, a new organizational structure, and that is the structure that's hosted at Butte College, but now with some sub awards in the region. And then an employer facing asset map is there sort of the entree into employers being able to be one aware of what we have and two being able to find a contact person at each community college to help uh, guide them through a partnership in terms of workforce training. So for our governance structure, we have what's called the Consultation Council, and it's been a, a rather narrow group of, of folks as we really did some soul searching and discussion. We realized that there were a lot of key uh, partners that were missing there. So um, we have a North Fire North Executive Director. We have a member from the Economic Workforce Development Advisory Committee at the Chancellor's Office. Two CEOs, one from the North, one from the Far North. Two CIOs, again, North Far North. Two CSSOs, one North Far North, and then two voting members. And those are representatives from the 15 colleges. What we've added is a two CT faculty, two CT students, hopefully that have been through a CT program or are on advisory boards for um, CT programs in the regions. Two assistant directors of employer partnership, and I'll explain a little bit more about what those roles are. Those are new for our region. You're familiar with the regional directors of employer engagement, similar, but with a different emphasis now. Um, adult education representative, the K-14 technical assistance provider, so we get input from our high school partners. We're going to have our two center of excellence representatives on there and also two um, workforce um, development boards as well. And all of them will be appointed by their constituency leaders. And the idea is to have regular two-way communication. We've really found that we're not hearing enough from the field. Um, we're really doing more of... Um, reporting out than having people reporting back in. And we need both in order to know what's going on and to best serve the region. For the organizational structure, this is the structure that's housed at Butte College now with some sub awards in the region. So we'll have an executive director. Um, we've got um, a fiscal program coordinator. Those are in existence and we have two administ administrative secretaries. But what's new is Shasta College was awarded uh, funding to or will be as soon as we get through our interviews next week, which is part of the process, a director of employer partnerships. And that director is gonna oversee 12 of the assistant directors of employer partnerships that are going to be scattered throughout the North and the far North region. We felt like we needed more coordination of employer engagement region-wide and to have one person that oversees all of these 
individuals that will be hosted geographically as, as well as hosted by sector at specific colleges um, would work out really well. So those are the new things in purple there. The director of employer partnerships will be hired out of Shasta College with a reporting dashed line to the executive director at Butte College. And then the assistant directors of employer partnership, there'll be seven generalists um, by region in the far north. The far north has always been challenged geographically just because the region is so huge and to have somebody to be one sector specific person in that area, it just creates a, a nightmare in terms of logistics. And so they thought it would be better to have the, um, the uh, directors of employer partnership located geographically so they're familiar with uh, the businesses in that particular region and can really develop those face-to-face -face partnerships. Whereas in the north, the Sacramento area, we decided on five more industry specific assistant directors of employer partnership to serve our needs. And I can go into some specifics on that. So for the north, the ADEPs as we're calling them, we had five. We have additional fundings that funds that we have held back to create partnerships. And as I listened to CEO Lau talking about what SMUD's doing, it's one of the perfect examples of how, you know, we could even as a region determine that we need to partner with an entity like SMUD to help us do some workforce training in electric vehicles. It doesn't have to be at one college and that would best serve the region's needs for that type of training. We've done partnerships with the North State Building Industry Association to do some recruiting for construction programs. So we wanted a little extra pot of money, which is why we only have five instead of seven in the North to be able to do those kinds of creative sub awards. But what we've decided is that we will have a health and public safety ADEP hosted at American River College. We'll have a construction energy and utilities uh, ADEP hosted at Cosumnes River College. And then at Lake Tahoe, we'll have a retail hospitality, tourism and ag water and environmental technology expert hosted there. Sierra has chosen to host the automation ADEP and then Woodland would have business and IT. And the idea is that these five would cover those sectors for the North College regions and the associated um, employer region areas. And then the far North, you can see that each one of the colleges in the far North has um, a generalist um, for employer engagement and partnership there that covers the regional employers for that particular area. So we're hoping that this level of collaboration and um, strategic placement of uh, individuals, especially in the far north, will help serve our employers better in having that one point of contact that they need um, to be able to develop the training programs to, you know, fill their jobs. The other thing that we've realized is that as much as we know what we're doing, a lot of employers don't want to have to navigate our different websites to try to find out what kind of training programs do we have, where are they, um, what do they consist of. And so what we have proposed in our RFA is to develop an employer facing asset map on our North Far North webpage that employers could go to to see which colleges are nearby to them and what kinds of programs do they have and who is that single point of contact at that college that an employer can get um, in contact with to let us know what their needs are. So we're hoping to get that up and running once we get um, funded and we get through our uh, interviews with the chancellor's office next week so that we can be more responsive and make you all aware of what it is that all of our community colleges have to offer. And then improved employer responsiveness. Um, I'm not sure if you know all of the sort of curricular operational changes that have made been made over the past few years, but it really has streamlined the curriculum approval process. And we know that we do not move fast enough for a lot of businesses. And we totally appreciate that, which is why we keep on fine tuning this to try to make changes to expedite this as much as possible. But for four credit programs that are transcripted on, on students' transcripts, we now have centers of excellence, which provide us with net labor market data to show, um, you know, if we develop this program, one, is it going to saturate the region? We don't want that. Two, can students get jobs in their, uh, in their field of study when they're done? And so in order for us to propose a program to our region, we have to get through that first step of showing a net labor market demand. And so the Center of Excellence has a standardized 
format that they use for their reports to give us what's called a program endorsement. And that's been hugely helpful. That used to be the responsibility of an administrator at the community college, which may have or have not have the various tools needed to conduct that research or the expertise. We also now have a digital platform for entering our program basics into um, a digital form for our voting members in the North Far North to examine what the program specifics are. So what we do as colleges is enter um, the course information, um, maybe what we think the enrollment's gonna be, um, the progression of courses on how they would be offered, et cetera, et cetera, and we submit that. And then that gets populated into a monthly call agenda with the North Far North where we endorse the programs. And the beauty of the form is, is one, you can do it online. We no longer have paper processes. And two, um, it goes directly to the North Far North staff at Butte. And then they populate an agenda and they send out surveys to each voting member to ask them to preview this before the meeting and to um, list any concerns you might have and also to list any comments that might be helpful for, for the author. And by doing it that way, we avoid hashing out details at the program endorsement meeting and everything is taken care of before we even get to the voting meeting, which really expedites things. Um, we have the monthly calls now. We used to only do these every couple of months. Now they're every single month. So you really could get a program um, get your labor market data done and get your shell put into the system and then get it endorsed by your uh, regional consortium all within a month's time. And then with these wonderful regional advisory boards like the one that we're having today, sometimes we can get um, multiple program proposals approved at an advisory board meeting. Uh, we did this for some of our building trades programs at CRC a while ago. We had a regional one for the building trades and we had um, an architectural design tech program, an architecture program, um, solar installer program, I think. And all of those got discussed in subgroups at that advisory board meeting and we were able to move forward with the minutes from that. So all of these innovations have really, really helped streamline the curriculum approval process for these four credit types of programs. The other thing that we've proposed in the RFA is some sort of a regionalized method of contract education. Um, so we can also do what's called not for credit training. And these are the types of programs that aren't transcripted on a student's transcript. And it allows us to be very nimble and quickly respond to an employer's need for workforce training. So we do it just by contract. We let the employer know what we can provide and how much it will cost. And there's no, um, formal curriculum process that we have to, to, to go through all the hoops that I just mentioned for a four credit process. It's a really smart way to um, meet a spike in demand for a particular program and then not have to create a program in perpetuity that we can't maintain, that we don't foresee a long-term need for the program. Um, and so I think that's something that employers should be aware of as contracted education might better meet some of your needs than always doing a four credit program that then has to be maintained in perpetuity and is much more difficult to discontinue for accreditation purposes. And then the last piece of this is increased work-based learning and job placement. So the ADEPs that I mentioned, previously the regional directors of employer engagement, which were sort of like what this new ADEP position would be, were more, um, involved with program development and maybe um, activity types of things. And now this new job description is really much more focused on actually working with the employer to see, can we provide some job shadows? Can you come and do some classroom presentations? Can we actually take field trips? Can you provide practicums or internships for our students? And then creating that well-established pipeline straight into employment. The benefits of these work-based learning experiences for employers are that they get to test drive some of our students, so to speak, in an internship experience and see, wow, this college is really turning out some great um, employees and I really want to invest in continuing this relationship. It also allows employers to give us input on core competencies and job readiness um, so that we develop the best programs that will meet your needs. So be prepared. We will be hiring some assistant directors of employer partnership very soon, and they are going to be eager to work with all of you and reach out to you. So we're excited about this new partnership for prosperity in our beautiful region. I can tell you there was no shortage of finding beautiful photos of the North Far North region. We live in one of the most beautiful places in the state of California, I think, and 
I'm really pleased to be able to provide you with this update today and hope that um, we get our allocation soon and can get busy on the work ahead. So I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thanks so much, Kim. If you have a question for Kim, you can either put it in the chat or you can raise your hand now. That was a pretty thorough presentation. I think it's uh, very encouraging to see the responsiveness of the community colleges to the acceleration and change and the need to upskill as rapidly as possible. Thank you. Okay, you must have covered it all, Kim, or we'll have your email on the last slide if questions come up. Um, we'll move to the employer panel now. Uh, oh, we do have one question. Is your partnership model going to be replicated in other regions? That is a good question. I have not read all of the RFAs that are in NOVA right now from the other regions, so I, I'm not sure exactly what all of them are doing. I do know that some of the other regions, though, are looking at having some more generalists rather than so many sector-specific types of um, ADEPs is what we call them. I'm not sure what some of the other regions are going to call them. So um, I think a lot of this is going to be you know, test cases, and we can see what the different regions are doing and what um, what seems to work best, but I'm excited about the changes. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our employer panel. Uh, we are so thankful for the employer representatives that are able to join us today. Um, so we have Matt Newton Boone, who's the training director with the Sacramento Shasta Butte Area Electrical Training Center in JATC. I had my hand up. I, I wanted to oh. address, uh, be, before we move on, I, I started to interrupt okay. here. Uh, Sierra College has been running for the last two years uh, non-credit residential boot camps and with our partnership with the BIA Foundation we have been able to we have some pretty good stats of getting our students into internships and into long-term uh, placement in, in a field of their choice out of this. Uh, this semester we're experimenting we have a, a one boot camp on in the first eight weeks that's residential focused and in the second uh, half of the semester, we are looking to do one with the MC3 training with uh, placement within the union trades, uh, specifically on the DGS building in downtown Sacramento. It's, uh, we, I, I, it's a non-credit course, so it's pr practically free. The only thing that the students have to do is show up. And we, like I said, we've had some good results out of that. And there's actually, uh, the BIA Foundation has had been generating reports for us that we would be happy to share. Thank you for sharing that. And maybe if you want to put your email in the chat for anyone who wants additional information, that'd be great. Uh, okay, so in addition to Matt, we have Will Barrett, Director of Sales and Business Development with Clipper Creek. We have Bobby Penn, General Manager with Coil Electric. Andy McHugh, uh, Fixed Operations Manager with Lion Electric. And we have Armando Orozco, who's Director of Facilities and Transportation. He's with Stockton Unified School District, previously with Trend Rivers Unified School District. And um, so we will get started with the questions. And the first question I have for you all is to provide a brief overview of your business, your role and the size of your workforce. And uh, Matt, I will ask you to answer that first. I know you're more of a training center, but if you could get us an idea of what you do at the training center, how many folks you see and how it, how it works. Sure, absolutely. Um, I am the training director of the apprenticeship program affiliated with IBW Local 340, which serves the jurisdictions uh, primarily in Sacramento, uh, Butte and Shasta counties. We have around 2000 journey level workers in this jurisdiction, and we currently have 300 apprentices today. Um, so my job is literally to train the new journey level workers in the course of a five-year apprenticeship program. Our goal is to take in people who may have experience, but we actually have our program adapted to um, taking people with no previous experience in construction as well. And over the course of five years, we will develop a fully fledged, well-rounded journey level electrician, state licensed. Thanks so much, Matt. And Will, I'll ask you the same question next. Uh, can you provide an overview of your business, the size of your workforce, and, and your role in the business? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm with Clipper Creek. We're uh, we're located up in Auburn, California. We uh, design uh, or engineer, design, and manufacture uh, EVSEs and EVSC accessories. Uh, an EVSC is uh, stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. It's an electrical safety appliance that's used to get power into plug-in vehicles for uh, charging to essentially, uh, you know, refill the vehicle. Um, our workforce has uh, grown pretty dramatically um, uh, this year as the plug-in vehicle uh, industry has accelerated. Uh, so at the start of the year, we had about 45 employees. Uh, we're up um, just a little over 80. Uh, the count is increasing basically every week. So uh, it's just 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 north of uh, 80 employees uh, today. And uh, we're actually actively looking for more. And we're hiring in um, all segments of the company. So we do everything from... Um, you know, engineering, you know, final assembly, manufacturing, marketing, human resources. We're 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 um, we're working to bring people in in all all spaces. Um, I oversee all of our sales and new business development activity, as well as uh, work with our our other directors at the facility to uh, develop and uh, execute on the company's goals. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, great to hear all of the hiring that's going on. We'll ask you more about how that's going in a further question. Bobby, can you tell us about Coil Electric, your role in the company and the size of your workforce? Great. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, really great to be on the on the call here with some of our, 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 our partners. Uh, so uh, Coil, I'm, I'm the general manager with uh, Coil. And uh, what we do is that we are the premier installer for um, the various OEMs and uh, EVSC manufacturers. Uh, we're partnered with, I mean, Clipper Creek, we work with them, we work with their partners such as Zeal who are partnered with them. So we are um, EV, um, a EV specialist company that's based in, the, in California and with offices in Sacramento uh, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and now we're licensed and we're expanding into you know, Washington State and Arizona and, and Oregon and, and so on. Um, you know, our focus is on level three. Uh, we're working with Line Electric on a project, on a level three project and level two installations. Um, and we support the end-to-end -end process. We also have software that uh, helps with quoting and working with electricians. And we and that software is being used by other uh, companies as well, uh, electricians to help quote and manage the quoting process and the design aspect of EV uh, charging. Currently, we have roughly around 30 um, electricians of various degrees uh, throughout the state. Um, and, and, and the biggest issues that we're having, we have a lot of issues as far as, uh, you know, uh, bringing on different folks because the quality and the type of person that you're looking for in EV installation is actually very different than uh, traditional uh, journeyman uh, type of uh, electrical work. And we can get into those kind of details, but there's a real very much distinction what our industry needs versus a traditional electrician. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll be interested to hear more. Um, Andy, can you tell us about Lion Electric, the size of your workforce and your role within the company? Sure. Um, thank you, Renee. Um, yeah, I, I also want to say thank you for the invite. And um, uh, I'm actually fortunate enough to have uh, a couple of my colleagues on the call as well. Um, Audrey Cipriani, who is uh, uh, head of our HR department in Canada, and then uh, Trania Green, um, also on the call. So for this question, actually, um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Audrey, if that's okay. Sure. Everyone. So yes, I'm actually based in Canada. I'm a part of a talent acquisition uh, team here. So obviously, I'm going to be able to answer a lot of questions uh, related to that. But just to tell you a little bit more about Lion, so we're a manufacturer of medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, we really create, design, and manufacture all electric vehicles, class five to eight, um, commercial urban trucks, bus, and minibus. Um, so actually, Lion is a Canadian based company. Um, well, right now, we currently have 900 employees um, based basically all across the US and Canada. 
Um, and just to give you an example, so we're growing very quickly. Uh, we hired 650 employees in the last year um, and, and we're not done. So right now, as you probably maybe heard, we are uh, building a manufacturing facility um, in Joliet, Illinois, which will host approximately seven to 800 employees. We will start recruit for that very shortly. Um, and we also have one manufacturing facility here in Canada and um, we are building a, can you hear me? And yesterday got an email that was like due tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, correction, due Tuesday. I was like, thank you. I'm gonna continue, I'm sorry. Um, so right now, like I said, we have a manufacturing facility here in Canada, one in the States that, that is being built. Um, and basically we have another um, battery factory under construction and 10 experience centers. So all across the States. So we have a lot um, going on right now, uh, definitely growing. So we'll be able to tell you a little bit more about the recruitment um, later on in the conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so Audrey, and, and specifically to my role, um, if I may, um, yeah. I oversee a very small portion of the of the operations for Lion Electric, but an important one, and that's um, parts and service operations in California. And uh, we also support a lot of the West Coast um, locations that we have as well. So, Thank you. And I noticed Susan put in the chat, you also have a location in Sacramento. Yes. Great. Thank yeah, you. in California, we have locations in um, Sacramento and also uh, in Alhambra, which is just north of Los Angeles. Okay, thank you so much. And then Ar Armando, we wanted to get your perspective from the school district side of things, um, having recently transitioned over Stockton Unified School District, who also has an electric bus fleet. Um, can you let us know about um, your role within the school district and how many uh, employees work on the electric bus fleet? Yes, good morning, everybody. So again, as you guys just mentioned, I'm Stockton Unified here and previously with Twin Rivers Unified School District. I helped Twin Rivers, I was there in the maintenance department and we put the infrastructure help facilitate and from the facility side, the infrastructure there for electric buses here at Stockton Unified. I've been here now a little over two months. Um, we have 12 electric buses, brand new infrastructure here. Um, but in both districts, what I'm, and I have actually even go back. So at Twin Rivers, we have four mechanics here we have just about the same mechanics as well, but our fleet, you know, it's exciting and new that we got the electric buses. It's the wave of the world. It's where we're headed to. Uh, we're slated, we're actually not slated. We're, we're shooting for another 14 buses here in the near future. Um, but we put the cart before the horse a little bit. I mean, the best analogy I can use because I don't have a fleet here. I don't have mechanics that have been trained on how to work on these buses yet. I know Twin Rivers are struggling a little bit to, font, to get the buses in, electric buses in for service. Um, but thanks to COVID and every which other you know, scenario that there is out there right now, the buses sat there in the yard, um, not being used. Um, again, thanks to COVID, <laughs> we didn't have students, but now that we're full in force, I just reached out to them yesterday and they have two buses they're waiting to be worked on. Here, um, our buses again are brand new. We just brought them online here at this beginning of the year. So that's kind of the challenges are, are kind of, I mean, and my direct role is transportation here, um, transportation facilities. So I have both, both sides of it here in Stockton Unified. Um, so it's kind of a little bit about us. Um, again, our bus fleet, we have 77 buses. Uh, and again, here in the new future, we wanna have a complete electric fleet, of course. Um, but again, that's just our major challenge right now is to get training courses set up and get my mechanics trained. I am flying a night position right now for a lead mechanic. And, and that'll be a, you know, a, a subject of conversation as we do the interview process is finding a mechanic that actually knows how to work on these electric buses or has some realm, some realm of electrical background on an automotive. I am an ASC certified mechanic as well. Um, and, and seeing the, some of the infrastructure on these buses um, looks like a complete facilities that has our solar panels. We have a lot of solar panels here in Stock Unified um, due to pg e such as about every one of our facilities has solar in it. So seeing the miniature version of that on a bus is, is pretty exciting for me actually being in both worlds, but that's kind of what our, our challenges and what we have going on here at Software Unified. Thank you, Armando. Andy, did you have something you wanted to contribute to that? Yeah, Armando, um, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I think we could probably support each other in that. So if you want to reach out to me offline, um, I think we can help. Uh, that's great. Wonderful. And then Armando, since I have you talking already and you kind of started to lead into this, 
um, when you're recruiting candidates for employment, what general skills and educational attainment are you looking for? What, what specifically would you be looking for in hiring for a mechanic or support positions for the electric fleet? Yeah, so actually, so in all honesty, I'm going to go outside the box on this one. I'm just a mechanic, you know, general mechanic. I, I would look for anyone that has any type of electrical background. And there's a lot to these buses here. So if somebody understands how electricity operates and how it gets to the motors on these buses it's kind of something that i plan to to veer toward that way of course many school districts have union entities behind it so we're writing job descriptions and and getting the training to my current employees here so that we could come to an understanding and get the you know get it advanced in the fleet so that's really what i'm looking for is electrical background of of any sort i know from the facility side of it, it, it there is that the, the world's changing these are not just you know, ordinary buses, um, going back to a facility side of at the house, we have um, pumps for, you know, high rise buildings. It's a lot of electrical behind that. Um, so that's, a, so my mindset is changing our fleet. My supervisors here are, again, we're, we're really talked about finding somebody with a strong electrical background, possibly even training my current electricians that I have here in the maintenance side of it and, and see if they would have an interest in learning automotive electricity or, you know, le electricity, electric buses, electric fleet vehicles in, in that realm. So. I know it's a probably a broad answer, but it's the technology is changing so fast that we're, we're truly behind the eight ball here. That's a great answer. Thank you so much, Armando. Um, Andy, I'll ask you the same question. When you're looking to recruit for positions with Lion Electric, what are you looking for in terms of skills and educational attainment? And then how do you currently recruit for, for candidates? Yeah, um, well, um, Audrey and Trini are, are a huge help in that, but um, you know the, the skill levels are all across the board, and and uh, you know like Armando stated, we are looking for any skill level, and really just somebody that has the aptitude, perhaps, um, or the ability to learn the technology. You know, you don't necessarily have to have the the experience, but you know the aptitude is is super important. Thank you. Um, Bobby, I'll ask you the same question. How do you currently recruit candidates and what are you looking for specifically in terms of skills and educational attainment? If you have specific certifications or uh, skills you're looking for? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think Matt probably can answer this one as well. If you're looking at a regular electrical company before electrification and, and, and EV, uh, you were looking at, you know, journeymen and, and um, uh, you know, whoever helpers and so on. Uh, and, you know, that's something that is typical. However, for us now, we're looking for folks that have experience. For example, we hired one who worked at at and in low voltage and who knows how to configure network routers and networking is a huge part. I mean, you know, a big par portion of our job is commissioning product, right? Um, and, and understanding that also the soft skills to educate people because, um, you know, we do a lot of work, both commercial and residential. So we are looking for the soft skills that need to happen so that, um, you know, inter interfacing, whether it's a, whatever customer it is, if we're in a multi-unit building or we're in a residence or we're in a commercial environment, there's a lot of interfacing that has to happen. So we really do look for people who have, not just the, the the electrical experience because you know we we can get uh that fairly easily um i hate to say that but it's the soft skills and the knowledge to be able to uh, work with technology work with commissioning work with with that um and that becomes a challenge because now you're looking at kind of almost two different people because electricians typically were not very friendly with that type of stuff and it's a big issue for us Thank you. Thanks for that very clear and accurate description. Um, Will, what are you looking for at Clipper Creek when you're recruiting candidates? How do you currently recruit them and what kind of skills and uh, credentials are you looking for? Sure. Um, well, uh, all different types. Um, so we, you know, we, we, we bring in people to do um, you know, a variety of different activities from uh, accounting, marketing, uh, human resources, uh, engineering. Um, so, you know, in, in, in those sectors, we're, we're looking for typical qualifications and, and educational backgrounds um, that, you know, sort of, sort of fit into those, uh, those roles. 
the vast majority or uh, the majority of our employees are in the manufacturing uh, side of things, um, just, you know, by, by quantity. Um, you know, uh, more than half the people that work at the company are, 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 are putting together our products that are, uh, you know, shipping, shipping out the doors. Um, and for that, uh, we look for, we, we uh, uh, look for, um, it could be a technical degree, it could be a, um, you know, a technical certification, um, you know, two year, four year degree, um, sort of anything in that zone. We, um, in our manufacturing team, we hire a lot of people that have come through programs like the uh, mechatronics program at Sierra College, um, as an example. Um, uh, but then, and then to echo, um, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, Bobby um, and Andy had kind of mentioned um, in, in other roles of the department, we or, or of the company, we've got, you know, a lot of uh, customer facing roles those softer skills, being able to uh, understand a technical appliance and then communicate that, uh, you know, in a in a in a way that a um, anybody can understand any type of customer, uh, someone who maybe is uh, well versed in these types of products and has done many projects with them, uh, to someone that you know just purchased a plug-in vehicle for their personal use and they want to be able to. Um, you know, buy an appliance to fill it up faster at home. And, and they have to, you know, we, we need people with skills that are able to um, interface with, with customers as well. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty wide, um, uh, wide set of uh, qualifications and, and skills and educational backgrounds that we look for depending on uh, the role in the company. Thank you for that. I want to honor the question in the chat specific to Lion Electric. Um, what skill set are required for the PMs uh, needed for your bus? Yeah, Ralph, can you clarify the question, PM? Preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance. What's you know, you know, luck, luckily on these buses, there's not a whole lot of preventative maintenance required. Um, you know, gone are the days of the oil changes and the coolant flushes and transmission services. Um, you know, there is some maintenance um, that you have to do um, in upkeep of the batteries and making sure all the lights and connections work and things like that. But, um, you know, a lot of that stuff, um, a lot of that stuff is is pretty basic and just inspections and you know so you know our our dream candidates are out there right we'd all love to to find a candidate that has all the skills in the world and can be a superstar on day one but i think what we're finding is at least i speak for myself um for several years now it's it's extremely difficult to find a dream candidate so what we're focusing on and what we're more open to now um, is really training um, internally and bringing people in who may not have any skills, but again, might have the aptitude or the, the desire and the interest. And, um, you know, you definitely have to have a little bit of mechanical background or at least, uh, again, the aptitude, but, um, you know, we're, we're open to, to, to anybody, um, you know, good attitudes, um, and the aptitude is super important. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Matt, I wanted to ask you about candidates that are entering the electrical training program. And I, I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, the kind of uh, minimum level of skills needed to enter the electrical apprenticeship program. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and combine it with the next question, which are what are the skills and gaps you see when people are coming into being a part of the electrical apprenticeship program? Sure. Yeah, there's um, quite a bit that's rattling through my mind right now. So I'm going to try and get it out in a comprehensive way. <laughs> uh, I'm going to validate what Bobby said um, and basically acknowledge and admit that there are different echelons of people within the trade. Uh, but to further that, I'm gonna make an argument that the electrical industry really has been segmented for a long time. Um, there have always been um, folks that would fit into an installer type of framework and um, a career path. And there are other folks that 
have either the aptitude or the desire to rise above into the areas of automation, um, industrial processes, uh, interfacing with customers, et cetera, et cetera. And we have those, uh, but over the course of our training and the development of these individuals, they end up being very highly skilled and they tend to be um, grabbed by their employers and held onto very tightly. So I uh, would agree with Bobby in a sense that finding these people tends to be very difficult. And that really is part of our mission is our selection procedures are trying to find these very highly skilled individuals. So as far as our selection procedures and what we're looking for, um, we have um, an aptitude test, which tends to be the largest barrier of entry. Uh, our selection procedures are standardized. They have been approved nationally by the Department of Labor. Um, the state of California. And, you know, there's the qualifications for entry are very simple. It's basically a high school graduation. Uh, they have to, or a GED, they have to display some algebra proficiency in the form of an algebra grade of C or better on their transcript. Uh, and then if their application becomes qualified, they move on to our aptitude test. And that has been traditionally the largest barrier of entry. Even for people who have a, a decent grades in algebra in high school can often stumble people up. Um, and it is, it's difficult. Uh, we've made strides in recent years of trying to improve our demographics, reaching out into targeted communities, trying to give jobs to people who need them the most. And this has uh, been a pretty tough hill to climb. Um, folks who maybe struggled through high school, they have a very difficult time getting through that aptitude test. But as far as candidates are concerned, it be just like any other employers, things like soft skills have been mentioned here, um, critical thinking skills, um, independence, uh, the ability to make decisions on their own, react to crises. These are all some of the um, themes that are touched on if they make it through the application process to an interview. So I think I wrapped it up, maybe. <laughs> Help you me out if I didn't. Great. No, you did a great job, thank you. Uh, um, Kim, I'm gonna ask you, if you could answer a question in the chat from Tammy Cronin uh, regarding the manufacturing sector, I'll have you answer it there. And Louie, I see your question. I just wanna follow up on the skills gap first and then we'll get to your question. Um, so, Will, I want to ask you, what are the positions you have the most difficulty filling and what are the skill gaps you frequently see from candidates? Sure. It's, it's a little bit, uh, so this year uh, has been particularly difficult to uh, find people um, and uh, particular, uh, in particularly people that uh, will continue to show up on a regular basis. Um, uh, but uh, as far as um, you know, most difficult positions to fill. Well, it's 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 similar in in challenges that others have have sort of mentioned uh, related to the fact that uh, this is. Uh, new technology. So finding people with experience in this specific field, um, you know, engineering, uh, sales, um, the, the manufacturing, it's, it's manufacturing an electrical appliance. That's, you know, just, just a matter of training uh, your, your procedures and things like that once you find a good candidate. But uh, people with actual relevant experience to this specific field, they just they, they they they're in very short supply um so you know we we've adopted a lot of internal training for uh the areas related specifically to these products the vehicles and 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 things like that um and um yeah so i think i think for us it's 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 relevant experience in this field that's probably the most difficult thing um and then, you know, just people that are, are uh, able and willing to learn and continue learning and, and, and apply those skills into the future. Thank you for that. And it sounds like I've heard a little bit about in-person training from a couple of you. So I'll include that in my next question to Bobby. Um, Bobby, what are the positions that are the hardest to fill? What are the skill gaps you're seeing? And have you developed any um, in-house training? Yeah, I, I think that's the that's the issue is that if you look at 
a position for somebody who could be well-rounded. I think um, that is, Matt kind of talked about, I mean, I like that he's talked about like, you know, industrial equipment or something like that. Um, if you look at EV chargers, they're relatively small to install. So they're not, they're not larger projects. So you need to have somebody who has a skill set who could go on site and be able to be a solution designer. They'll have to do things like, okay, how much power is this? How do I set this up? Then I have to be able to talk and explain it to the customer or, or be on site. And then I have to be able to configure a router and a network and the SIM card and make sure that that's all working. And so, you know, that that's a real challenge is like finding somebody who can actually take on that made that role and be able to input that. Those are the people that we have a really hard challenge finding um, uh, for, for for the for the for the position. Um, and they're very difficult to find because of that and have that ability. Thank you. So do you uh, have some in-house training or you're really just looking for that teachable, coachable, capable, well-rounded candidate, and then you are willing to train them in different aspects of the business or am I not? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. We do have in-house training. We are moving to having a uh, training platform that we've put together. And this, this goes in from training our salespeople how to do this because I mean not just the technician but how to you know we have to train salespeople on this ability you have to train them because one of the things that's very unique about this uh, we service a lot of multifamily buildings as a matter of fact working with SMUD's program that they have right now so you have to go through an educational process that's that you have to and the salesperson has to know how to do it so the first engagement other than a typical electrical like if you're just doing a right electrical system or whatever it is you go hey i want outlets i want lights i want whatever i want that's what i want you don't really have to explain that to someone but here you have to you our function is from engagement is to have to explain you know that uh, that process and even even with like lion when we're working with them you know, you have to explain, okay, what is the right size of a level three for, for example, for a fleet and how do you mix level two and level three and all those things that have to happen. I mean, that is a huge training process on the front end that we have to do. Um, on the back end, we absolutely have to have training with different SIM cards, with different networking. Um, uh, we utilize training materials. Fortunately, we're, we're one of the biggest channel partners, or the, the channel partner with Tesla. So they have a lot of great training materials that we leverage as well. But it is really difficult because that all has to be collated. And, and, and it's you're training like multiple types of people. And it's the front end that you have to train and it's the back end that you have to train. And they have to work well. Thank you. Thanks for that description. And I will uh, add, give this question to the Lion Electric team, I suppose, uh, maybe starting off with Andy or however he wants to delegate. You know, what are the positions that are the most difficulty filling? Uh, what skills are you having a challenge uh, locating? And what, if any, in-house training have you ad adopted in order to meet those challenges? Yeah, um, yeah, training is a huge part of our culture. We have a great um, in-house training program um, we act as a hub uh, for training um, for a lot of the other locations throughout the United States. Um, a lot of the technicians come to us and we train here in-house. So um, it's a daily ongoing thing. But I, I wanted to, um, Susan Wheeler asked a question about, um, and if I may, you know, employers always say that soft skills and aptitude are, are most important. However, the recruiting process is set up to look for people with experience in specific areas and then, you know, that you don't get interviews. So um, I was hoping um, maybe one of my colleagues, um, Terania, can address that question um, because I think we do a, a fairly decent job in that. Uh, my name is Terania. I am our HR representative uh, for Lion in the U.S. I am actually out of our Sacramento location. Um, as far as recruiting and our efforts to um, look for talented people, um, our main focus now is within our service department. Um, so looking for service technicians and EV specialists. Um, eventually, we also are looking uh, to hire more engineers for our facility in Juliet. And with the amount of um, 
vehicles coming out of that facility, um, continuing to hire more techs, more EV specialists to not only service the vehicles, but also train on um, the specifics of the vehicles um, as well as very important. Um, for us, in-house in, in -house training is extremely important. Um, so if an applicant or employee does not have that particular experience, training in-house, um, giving that proper guidance so an employee can thrive. Um, but um, if they do have experience, of course, that's very well welcomed. Um, we think it would be great to see different internship programs, um, also like dedicated programs within schools locally, um, also throughout the US um, would be very helpful. Um, when we, um, I personally talk to a lot of our uh, tech applicants and they'll have the essential like automotive experience, but once it gets to the EV side, um, that's where we see most of the gaps. Thank you for that. And Armando, I think you may have answered some of this already, but I'll just um, provide it, the question to you in case you have anything additional to add. Um, what are the positions that are the most difficult for you to fill? What skills um, are you having a challenge with? And then what, if any, um, in-house training are you doing? And I think you kind of talked about maybe moving people over from facilities or other areas in order to fill gaps. But if there's anything else you want to add? Um, not really. I mean, again, it's just, you know, now that we're, we're hiring right now for a couple of mechanics, we just, there. I just can't find electric bus mechanics. So that's where we're really struggling in the whole realm of that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, Louis, I'll have you just unmute and ask the question that you put in the chat to the panel and, and we'll uh, open it up for anyone who wants to answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, a little bit about me. I am an electrician. Um, Matt, I went through the training program with Matt's predecessor. So I have been an electrician for 24 years. I've met with Andy and several other you have heard me speak before. I've talked with some of you before about curriculum and things like that. Um, my question to the panel is, in your opinion, what is the most difficult skill set to develop or what takes the longest, the electrical side or the automotive side? Because if you're going to develop a program, my thinking is that you focus on the longer one and then add the shorter one in as a last minute. Personally, now, uh, and this, I would think that it would be the electrical one, and, but I'm biased. Like I said, I'm an electrician. Um, but I would be kind of curious to see when you are hiring someone in, um, I'm probably going to butcher your name, Terania, uh, mentioned that the automotive was easy, but the electrical was the one that needed development. So to the panelists, is that consistent with you? Yeah, if I may, Louis, it was good to see you again. Um, yeah, I mean, my own personal opinion, um, you know, I grew up in the automotive industry. I've been working um, in the automotive industry. Uh, I'm going to date myself here since 1986. And, uh, you know, I'm still learning. Um, but I'm finding that the EV world, you know, there's a lot less moving parts. Um, you know, in my honest opinion, I think the EV technology is a little easier than the automotive. Um, internal combustion engines and transmissions, there's a lot more working parts. Um, you know, I think that's a more difficult skill to learn. So, um, I mean, that's my own personal opinion. I'd, I'd love to hear everybody else's opinion on that. Yeah, if I could just jump in, I think that most of the electric vehicles are, they're more uh, swap, right? It's plug and play. You just swap out motors, you swap out components, modules, and um, it's very, and there's, you know, there's manuals, there's, there's a lot of like information to, to help someone. And most of the time, um, these things are well enough engineered that they only really go in one way. Um, so you, you kind of, if, 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 if you get it to click and it works and it's in, then it's, it's in. And, and, and then the, the product itself is sent to a depot or some other place where it's repaired. So you're not... It's gone as the, the days of a mechanic with like, you know, five different systems and it's the alternator or the carburetor or whatever it is. And, and you know, it, it, it basically the system is, it's like working on an iPhone and you go to like an Apple store. They, they just replace either it's the screen or it's the phone and that's it. You get a new one. Um, so I think it's a little bit easier 
um, then, 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 then the, the problem with the electrician is, is that you don't have that. The electrician has to be the one who designs and puts it in and has to do things like, did I put the right wire gauge in there? And did I put, you know, did I do the, 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 the harness correctly? Or did I connect it to the right breaker? And did I connect it? And you are now relying on the electrician them to ensure that it's properly installed as opposed to like let's just say honestly if you're plugging if you're putting in a new motor you just like attach it and plug in and, and that's it i mean but with with an electrician there's so many areas where you could lose and it's and and that's kind of like the quality of of work is determined by that single person so I think, obviously, I think it's the electrician that's much, much, much harder in, in this ecosystem. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on Louis's question? Okay, Susan, I'm gonna have you unmute and ask your question. I know Andy addressed it somewhat, but um, for the rest of the panelists, if you wanna share your question. Yeah, thank you, um, Renee. So it's, um, and I, Correct me if I misheard, but it sounded like almost everyone on the panel talked about the importance of soft skills or what I've also heard referred to as job readiness skills as that being almost paramount. Um, obviously with um, uh, some of the positions, it, it, um, more, um, more technical training is, is needed, but it sounded like kind of the floor is, is having those job readiness slash soft skills and that um, companies are willing to bring in somebody who may not have all of the experience needed as long as they're teachable, you know, trainable, but, but have those basic foundational skills. My question is that it seems that the recruiting process really doesn't jive with that. You know, what we've seen is um, if you look at an entry-level job description, it asks for X number of years of experience, and that's for entry level. So, how do we how do we get the recruiting process to match what we're hearing employers say that it's more important to have em employees who have those soft skills and and then be able to teach them? How do we how do we how do we get rid of that art, what seems to be an artificial barrier in the recruitment process? Thank you, Renee. Maybe I can jump a little bit on that one, um, more on an HR perspective, but, you know, I think COVID affected that in a sense that, you know, those in-person events, we cannot host them anymore. So we rely on, you know, a resume, a piece of paper that resumes um, obviously a person. So I think going back to these in-person events or even having those with colleges would be interesting. And I know we've talked here at Lion to, you know, go in and, and meeting with the students throughout their semester, throughout their program, just to kind of introduce ourselves and building that first relation. Um, so I think it would be interesting to include that, um, which would give us that, you know, first impression and not just relying on a piece of paper and just looking back at the experience that a person would have. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on Susan's question? Yeah, if, if I may add to that, um, I know, you know, again, I, I had mentioned our focus is shifting. You know, we're, we, we hire for all different positions from service managers to parts managers, parts associates, shipping and receiving um, technicians, entry level, um, you know, it's the gamut. Um, and some of those positions require specific skills and we have to find the specific person to fill that job. But, you know, in terms of a technician, um, you know, those are becoming more increasingly more difficult to find. And so just recently um, this week, um, we have placed uh, new help wanted ads, um, I think on Indeed, I'll let uh, Trania speak to this, but um, specifically targeting entry level um, technician positions. So. Um, and I don't believe that that job description asks for any sort of um, experience necessarily. Um, so I, I, again, I'll let Trent Trania maybe expand on that. Yeah, hi. So um, we do have a need as far as the service technician position. And we did see that 
we do get you know a few applicants here or there with very minimal experience, but um, sometimes they'll indicate on their resume that they've had maybe six months um, working in oil. Um, or um, maybe just sort of some school courses in some type of mechanic or electrical um, type of sector. So we did want to introduce an entry level position. This would be a person who would start from the ground up basically. Um, so we'll teach them all things automotive, all things um, electrical. Um, we would basically build this person. Uh, with our other service technician roles, they do have a little bit more experience. Um, so it's a different sort of training program. So this would be basically um, from start to finish. Thank you. And I see that John Pellman has his hand raised. Did you? Yeah, I just had a, I had a question, kind of a follow up on the discussion of curriculum. Um, so I'm coming from the perspective of, uh, of the K-12 world and career tech ed. And what's interesting to me uh, among the many things about electric vehicles and curriculum is, you know, it can be, there's some people have described them as, you know, computers on wheels. So is it, should there be curriculum that is more in the ICT or computer science world? Should it be in the engineering or the manufacturing world? Should it be in the transportation should it be engineering and architecture? And those are all different industry sectors um, that, you know, how do we as high school folks, um, how do we get our hands around this in far, as far as teaching it and developing curriculum for it? Is it all of those sectors? Is it, is it none of those sectors? You know, if you could kind of give us some guidance there, that would be helpful. Great question, thank you. Any so of our I'll panelists? speak to this if I could. Yeah. Um, this is going all the way back to what Bobby said in his initial statements. Um, I personally, as uh, an educator in my own right, have been very excited at the advancement of programming classes um, and these various you know, technology influences that we're starting to see. Uh, the, like I said, the electrical world has always been segmented and the concept of programming and just being able to critically think and follow the logical uh, flow of progression of a circuit and how it triggers different events and um, you know just the sequencing of logic through an automation process is it is directly correlated to programming and i don't know if a lot of people really understand that so when we're trying to develop people to go in and do electrical troubleshooting those things are huge and we're already seeing the results of people who have touched on programming at the secondary level, or you know, maybe even as a, um, a hobby. And they're they're bringing these skill sets into our classrooms, and they're being able to take it to the next level in the electrical field. So, I love those things. Uh, computer networking is um, always going to be there. You know, uh, there's a segment of the electrical industry that I don't personally train on, um, but we have a low voltage apprenticeship as well. And they tend to focus more on these on these areas. So I, I see those as very valuable too. I mean, computer networking is not going to go away. And these IT technologies are just going to be further and further saturated into our workforce. So I'm all for it. Thank you. I see Andy's hand is up. Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to add to that. Um, you know, one of the unfortunate um, things that has been happening over the years is the funding for the um, ROP programs in the high schools. And a lot of the ROP programs are getting shut down. And I mean, I think personally, I think that's where it starts. And, you know, in, in my prior life working for dealerships, you know, I had great relationships with uh, some of the high schools and the ROP programs. And, uh, you know, I think, any kind of curriculum could start there, you know, instead of teaching combustion, you know, maybe you have a whole week or a whole um, segment on EV, doesn't necessarily need to be engineering or electrical, you know, you could talk about electrical basics, but you know, how is an EV put together? How does it work? How is it controlled? You know, that kind of thing. And then along with that, you know, again, we had great success with um, uh, kids coming in and working um, in internships um, through the ROP program. And a lot of those people we, we hired uh, once they graduated. So um, I hope that answers your question um, for the K through 12, at least um, people. Well, I'd like to add one more thing, if I may. I think for K through 12, it's going to be 
incredibly important that we teach energy as as the basis and and not approach it just you know so myopically i mean obviously we're here in evs but we should talk about how energy is being produced what is energy you know why is it important i mean that's the one thing is that we really haven't talked talked about you know how is it produced how how does how is it delivered and from and i think that that is a foundational skill set that everybody who goes through through high school should know okay how how is how is what is the grid i mean what is you know i mean those really basic things they, they don't we don't have to even get to like you know how to how, you know how to switch gear or what switches and so on but like you know they could understand why why is it that you know uh we're we're going to a evs versus combustion how is energy what is self-generation what is solar what are batteries what how are things those 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 kind of like common things about you know how our society generates power i think is is a fundamental class um i don't know if that's like a whole year or a portion of it or something but that needs to be part of it so that uh we as humans and as educated people walk out of there knowing how, how we consume something that's you know we all use I mean, we, we need that Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, I wanted to ask Kim or Jeff Briggs if you would answer a question that Jana has about the difference between an internship versus an apprenticeship in CTE programs. If Kim or Jeff is available to answer. Yeah, I mean, apprenticeship is very specific um, program that typically we don't have them at CRC, but we do pre-apprenticeships, which require a certain measure of technical skills in order to even get into the apprenticeship with the trade. Um, and I believe the trades are the ones that invite the, the, the students in. Our internship programs on campus um, will help students find matches on our um, Handshake platform and um, pro, you know, provide students with either paid or unpaid internships and apprenticeships typically are, are paid from what I know. So um, those are some of the differences that I know. Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so um, an apprenticeship program, usually um, there's an expectation at the end of the program where an employer is going to hire and retain that individual. Um, and um, the way that, um, you know, we've, we've actually, um, the re this region has worked really hard to put together an apprenticeship program um, for the manufacturing sector. And um, the way that it works really is um, you don't have to have any particular skill set. They'll take you at any level. So um, but once you get in there, um, the idea is that employers will um, take those um, take those employees on once they get to a certain a set of skill sets and then continue to um, build on those skill sets as they uh, progress in employment at that firm. Um, with an internship, internships are generally more short term related, whereas, um, and, and also doesn't necessarily require too much skill. Um, and it's usually um, a semester or a summer or a break during a break period. Um, so you're, you're generally dealing with much, uh, you know, there's a lower expectation of a certain uh, set of skills. Um, and, um, and then the employer um, usually uh, will hopefully retain that individual later, but there's, it's not as big of an expectation. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. I know we're getting close to the end. I do want to ask um, one of our last questions, which is, um, do you have any part, any experience partnering with the community colleges? So I want to put that question out to the panel, if any of the panelists have uh, experience partnering with community colleges. Um, we partnered with the City College of San Francisco a few years back. And um, we, we did a couple of their fairs and we were able to get a couple 
um, very interesting people because they had a program. Um, as of COVID, once that COVID hit, it, it, it you know it became virtual and no one really attended it. And um, we hope that that's something that we could uh, tap into again. Thank you. So mostly for a hiring fair kind of relationship. Yeah, uh, hiring fair. Um, they as long as there's an electrical program there at the at the community college was, was we were looking at, and it was it was it was a it was a good area for us. Um, but with COVID, it, it, we haven't gone back in a couple of years, so can't really speak to. Thank you. Any other panelists with experience with uh, partnering with the community colleges? We have had a long, decades long relationship with American River College. Um, they actually have oversight over us. They're called our LEA, um, and they're assigned to make sure that we are on track with our training program and our curriculum model. Uh, but they also have their own uh, electrical trainee program and uh, pre-apprenticeship that they run. They tend to send candidates our way from time to time. Thank you. Anyone else with experience with community college or any suggestions, any specific suggestions from our panelists on what the community colleges can do or develop in response to what's changing in this industry that will we'll round it out with that question. Any specific suggestions to the community colleges? Yeah, if, if I may, um, you know, just expanding um, and making a more uh, robust electrical or EV uh, program um, or curriculum. Um, I love some of the things that Kim Harrell had to say about on the job training and um, allowing employers to come in and speak and um, reaching out to prospective employers for input and collaboration. I think that's great. Um, but yeah, we just need to expand that, that part of the curriculum. Um, and I wanted to kind of piggyback on what Bobby said in that, um, I, I loved what he said and at least introducing people to the technology um, and the grid and some of the basics, you know, you, you don't know that you like it until you like it, until you try it, right? So we, we could be swaying some people to come to the EV side if we just expose them to some of the cool things that we're working with day in, day out in the, in the ever-changing uh, technology. I may add to that, Andy, you know, something that I've seen um, in other countries that's being done, like here in Canada, that people really appreciate is having throughout the curriculum, maybe a few days where the actually students could come to the facility and just really visit, like Andy said, and, and really see the environment we're in, or even just having a day that is dedicated to meeting different employers from the industry and, and kind of starting to build that relationship with the different companies. And um, just really quickly, just to interject, um, thank you for all of your responses. It seems like um, Renee is having some internet issues. Um, so since it is 1034, I just wanted to respect everyone's time and really just thank you for making it out today. Thank you to all of our panelists for giving such insightful answers. Um, we really hope that this space was really conducive for everyone and educational. Um, so here, is some contact information if any of y'all have any additional questions or if y'all need anything. And of course, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, guys. No, thank you. Bye-bye.